Tonight, I'm going to speak about Arctic governance from a personal perspective based upon my experiences. Before I get into the heart of the matter, I would like to provide you with some basic information and context about Inuit and myself and what led me to fight for the rights of Inuit and other indigenous people here in Canada and abroad. My name is Kulak. I'm named for my great-grandfather, who is the leader of our clan. I was burnt, birthed by my clan, by my clan's midwife, Tikala, while my, fa my, my father, Kuptana, was out seal hunting. It is said that the polar bear walked by the igloo into which I was born in the Prince of Wales Strait. This is part of the Northwest Passage. Later, my cousins and I had a pet polar bear. This oral history of myself and my family is not unique. It is also the shared history of many Inuit across the circumpolar region. In the late 1950s, my parents, William and Sarah Kupana, settled into Sachs Harbor and to build houses for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Federal Department of Transport in what was to be in what was to be Canada's bid for Arctic sovereignty. When these outsiders arrived into a new territory, they did not find the people in chaos. You know, were exercising their inherent right according to their natural laws, dictated by animal migrations and the many moods of the environment. These natural laws today have become the Inuit way of knowing, as outsiders have need to simplify this language for science as anecdotal evidence, calling it simply traditional knowledge, thereby reducing a complex level of science based upon an observation over a millennia to sometimes an anecdotal science evidence. However, I'm going to elaborate on this more complex science later in my presentation. When outsiders arrived, they did not find a land vacant of human occupation or terra novus, that piece of legal fiction to take human ownership from indigenous people. That was not the case. Let me give you some examples. <coughs> I heard from my mother and father <coughs> these following stories about outsiders. My father was sold to the Valmer Stephenson expedition around 1912 by my grandparents for a gun, ammunition, clothing, and food. Kuptena was about 12 years old and considered a man because he knew how to hunt. This is how the expedition survived, because my, hunt, my father hunted for the crew. Likewise, the Henry Larson crew 
on an RCMP St. Rock encountered by my mother's plan. That too is how they survived the winter. My extended family hunted for them. Others would not be so lucky. Take the Franklin Expedition crew who refused to embrace Inuit ways in the Arctic. As we all know, they perished and instead governed themselves accordingly and many die of lead poisoning from their canned foods and their canned goods. Now I'm going to talk about the occupation. The occupation. The occupation. There was a time when the occupier the outsider held all the power in which I call the occupier of the Arctic, Canadian Arctic. Suddenly new laws were instituted by the outsiders. I saw my father's hunt of the snow bees taken away from him because they were hunted out of season. I saw my mother and her sisters of clothing for the RCMP without payment. They also cleaned their furs and did many other menial chores. When I was eight years old, the RCMP officer came and got me and boarded me onto a beach aircraft for residential school. I went to residential school for 13 years where I was educated under the Alberta curriculum and that gave me the skills to fight for the injustices I saw as a child. In other regions of the Arctic, measures were being taken to ensure that Inuit stayed in the settlements. There was a systematic dog slaughter of the dog teams in many parts of the Arctic, mostly again by the RCMP. Inuit were relocated to the high Arctic from northern, from northern Quebec and became known as the high Arctic exiles. Inuit children were forced into residential or day schools education, which were enforced by the RCMP, with the penalty of holding family allowance checks for non-compliance. Some Inuit women were sterilized without the knowledge and consent, as was in the case of my mother. The churches were banned. The churches came and banned Inuit spiritual practices, in particular, shamanism, conversion to the art. One of the Christian religions was paramount. During the occupation, the heart of Inuit society was targeted to separate families and to forbid the spoken language of Inuit Nakhtur an aspect of the Inuit language, you know, or the Inuit language. The federal government did much to keep track of Inuit, who, by the way, had one name. By giving them dog tags so they could keep track of them, and later gave Inuit names through what was called Project Surname, in which they gave Inuit last names. I mentioned the occupation in which the rights and practice of Inuit were ignored, and Inuit had no say in the remaking of Inuit lands and territories, 
and we felt little control or governance over our own lives. However, the 1970s gave birth to the Inuit rights movement. The message was loud and clear. The birth of the Inuit nation in Canada and internationally was born. Inuit were known to be as Inuit. The impending pipeline in the Western Arctic and the hydroelectric projects in northern Quebec drove the Inuit agenda over rights to land, surface, and subsurface rights, and other socioeconomic concerns and worry for the environment. A land claims agreement was tabled in the House of Commons in 1975. This claim included the entire Inuit territory in the Arctic. However, it was subsequently untabled by the Inuit peers of Canada over some of the legalities and legal theorem. Inuit have much to be proud of. We have much governance over our own territory. The following are the Inuit land claims agreements which have been finalized in Canada. The James Bay, Northern, the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, 1975, the Inuvialui Final Agreement, 1985, the Nunavut Agreement, 1993, and the Nunatsevut Agreement, 2007. These land claim agreements are very significant for Inuit Canadians in that they ask for preferential treatment of Inuit and treatment of Inuit on preferential lands. They ask for training and education. There's a socioeconomic devel development fund. There's an environmental process, which is often more rigorous than Canada and often a wildlife organization. Well, I state the very significant achievements of Inuit land claims, I believe they are fundamentally flawed, especially in the area of women and child rights. There are hunter assistance programs. There's no equivalent for women's activities in what was once a matriarchal society. What is wrong? While the government of Canada may see our relationship as ending with land claims agreements, we see it as just the beginning, as much unfinished business between Canada and Inuit. And Canada is not always a political member of these agreements. And sometimes they have to be reminded through the arbitration process. And I might state here that Inuit have been through the land claims arbitration process, and Inuit have won every arbitration case in Canada. Furthermore, the rules for engagements are drawn up by the federal government, okay? In a respectful world, principles would be negotiated first, then the details. The question begs to be asked, 
Why would Canada not agree to such a process? It is a fear. A fear of losing power or power sharing. It's the same old notion. We know better. We say, hey, what happens? That becomes so old, that notion. Our land, our environment has made Inuit who we are. The government has made us the largest land owners in the world. However, we only saw ourselves as stewards. Inuit Nunat. Inuit Nunat means the lands or territory of Inuit. The Inuit nation lives in four circumpolar countries, Canada, Alaska, Greenland, Russia. Some of you may know us as Eskimos. We, we prefer to be called as Inuit. Internationally, we number at about 155,000 people. Inuit are a people. Inuit share a sh unique culture. Two Inuit languages, Siberian Yupik and Inuit too. We have age old traditions and values. Inuit have their own history and live in the most unique geographic locations on Earth. These are some of the characteristics that define Inuit as a people. And these characteristics are elemental to Inuit governance. Inuit are extremely well organized. At the international level, Inuit are represented by the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which has NGO status with ECOSOC. The Inuit Circumpolar Conference was envisioned by Ibn Hobson of Point Barrow, Alaska. Currently, the ICC chair, her president is from Alaska, or is from Canada. Ukalitia of Iqaluit in Nunavut. She was one of my formidable assistants during my tenure at the Inuit Tipperary of Canada. Nationally, Inuit in Canada are represented by Inuit Tepaid Canada Me, which is the national polit political voice in Canada. The four land claims organizations are members of the board of directors of ITK, along with members, along with representatives of the National Inuit Youth Council and Pogtuti. <clears throat> During the 1990s, the Inuit tabled and negotiated the South Government Agreements during Charlottetown discussions and claimed close to winning the recognition of the inherent right of self-government in Canada, but subsequently lost his piece of work through the referendum. At the international level, Inuit through ICC fought hard for the recognition of Inuit as a people, along with other indigenous peoples at the UN Human Rights Conference in Vienna. During that time, we had convinced countries like India 
not to intervene or vote. And this was very historic in that they did not During the vote for division between the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, Inuvialuit were instrumental in pushing the yes vote after President of the Inuit uh, Regional Corporation, Roger Group, and myself went to each Inuvialuit community and held town hall meetings, and that's really what pushed the whole Nunavut notion ahead. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, traditional knowledge or the Inuit way of knowing, because I know this is one of the things that uh, scientists and others are always concerned about. So I just want to state from my point of view that Inuit have a very vast knowledge of the constellations and the world around us as a way to help us to travel. They have vast knowledge of marine currents I have myself been involved in being able to travel vast distances between 20 foot waves and my father knew how to navigate those areas because he'd been taught how. Every Inuk man that has to take care of his family has to have knowledge of geometry. You have to have knowledge of geometry in order to build an eagle. Okay. And there are products for our environment that no other human culture has been able to perfect. And I'm going to just speak about those a little bit. One of them is kayak building. No other culture has been able to, do, to perfect the design of that kayak. And why is that? because we already had the signs done right. Um, the whole idea of multi-igloos gave birth to the whole notion of malls in southern white communities because that's how our communities were built at one time. And that's how the whole notion of malls came about.
Kolita, Kolita. The design of the Inuit for Perka has not been perfected by anybody else. And you know, they've learned how to use the hollow the fur of things like The animal. I can't remember the name of it. The wolverine. These are some of the things that help that have helped to shape Inuit society. However, when I talk about the ratification of these very significant arrangements at the national and international level, there's still the reality, especially in places like Nunavut, where in 1985, the Department of Indian and Non Affairs published a report entitled an overview of the demographic and socio-economic conditions of Inuit in Canada. The report included demographic research that went back far back as 1931, covering the 50-year periods between 1931 to 1981. And in 1931, there were 5,914 Inuit in Canada, compared to 25,390 Inuit in 1991. So that's a formidable increase in, let's say, 50 years. The report went on to state the following. The purpose of the report is to describe the Inuit ethnic group in terms of its demographic evolution and specific socioeconomic conditions. <coughs> this publication provides information <coughs> which should be useful for policy and program development, strategic and operational development or programming, and performance measurement. After that report was published, the Inuit population grew from just over 25,000 in 1981 to 50,000 in 2006, which is another doubling in the Canadian Inuit population in just over 25 years. There are other statistics from the 2006 consensus that were relevant, which we will look briefly as Inuit. Inuit have the youngest population in Canada. The median age is, in Canada is 40, versus the median age of Inuit is 22 years old. Inuit have the lowest life expectancy in Canada. The average life expectancy 
expectancy in Canada is 79.5 years versus the average life expectancy of Inuit at 67 years. Inuit live in the most overcrowded housing in Canada, and that's evident in Nunavut. 3% of Canadians live in overcrowded housing versus 38% of Inuit live in overcrowded housing. It's not a significant number. Inuit have the lowest education levels in Canada. 85% of Canadians have, the high, have a high school diploma and 23% of a university degree versus 49% of Inuit have a high school diploma and only 4% of a university degree. It's not appalling, assistant, appalling assist statistics. Inuit have the highest unemployment rate in Canada. I'm not happy to say that. 7% of Canadians are unemployment in 2006. This is a new input. Versus 20% of Canada were, of Inuit were unemployed. Despite these dismal statistics, Inuit are the most successful land claims and self-government negotiators in Canada and in the world. Over the last 40 years, Inuit have been busy and the governance continuum has significantly involved with the settlement of all Inuit comprehensive land claims, covering one third of Canada. This includes the James Bay the 1975 James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, the Inuit Valley Final Agreement, the 1993 Nunavut Land Claims Agreement, the 2005 Labrador Land Claims Agreement, and the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement, which happened in 2006 with respect to offshore Inuit have also negotiated the establishment of public governments and Inuit self-government institutions as part of the land claims processes. Okay. In 1978, the Kadivik Regional Government was created in Nunavik. In 1999, the Nunavut Territory and the government of Nunavut were created. In 2005, Nunatsiavut government was created and as created as a self-government Inuit self-government Negotiations continue in the, in the, in the Inuvialuit region where an Inuit government will be created. And in Nunavik, where Inuit are negotiating the, uh, the cons consolidation of Nunavik institutions, which were established under the James Bay Northern Quebec and James Bay Agreement. Okay. Now that I've set out some of the some of the context, let's get into the three strategic issues which I mentioned earlier. One is the spirit and intent. 
The first is implementing the spirit and intent of the land claims and self-government agreements that Inuit have con concluded over the last 40 years. And the self-government agreements, we continue to in negotiation with the Inuvialik and in the Nunavik regions. The Government of Canada first started establishing Inuit communities in the 1950s and 60s as part of its claim to sovereignty over, Ar over, the, Arctic re over uh, the Arctic, Canadian Arctic. To assert this claim, the government used RCMP to take children away from their families and send them to residential schools. It used missionaries to deliver government services to Inuit on behalf of the government of Canada. It allowed the Hudson Bay Company to establish trading posts in Rupert's Land. It constructed and maintained new line sites across the Inuit territories and it approved the extraction of resources from our Inuit homelands. After the government of Canada first started exercising jurisdiction in the Arctic, Inuit no longer had any decision-making authority over their own lands, over their own people, they were not consulted by government, by mining companies, before mining companies began operating. And in the 1970s, Inuit decided that enough was enough. So really, the spirit and intent of all the land claims and self-government agreements is clear. Inuit negotiated these agreements to provide Inuit the ability to regain control over their own lives, to ensure that Inuit were able to continue their traditional way of life, to ensure that Inuit were able to, oh dear, to ensure that Inuit would benefit economically from development to ensure that they would be able to establish government institutions so that Inuit would have the jurisdiction and authority to make decisions over their own lands. And with respect to their own people, I could go on and on, but all I could say is that Inuit would not have signed an agreement if they thought that some of these objectives were not being met. So if there was a problem, they would not sign with the government of Canada, whether, was, there, were this, whether there was a problem with implementation or interpretation. So let's just take a quick look at some of these examples of how the spirit and intent of these agreements are not being honored by the government of Canada. The one billion dollar lawsuit against the government of Canada and the government of Nunavut for not implementing the Nunavut Lines Banks Agreement, which was filed in 2006, and it was recently settled out of court. NTI claimed the government of Canada was underfunding all the institutions of the public government 
that were established under the land claims agreement, including the Nunavut Impact uh, Review Board, the Nunavut Water Board, the Nunavut uh, Surface and Rights Tribunal, the Nunavut Planning Commission, the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board, and so on. So together, all these organizations are responsible for ensuring that Inuit are able to control the pace of resource development in, in, in the Nunavut area. Ensuring that the development's done in an environmental, sustainable manner, ensuring that Inuit benefit from the job and business opportunities that come from resource development, ensuring that Inuit are able to continue their traditional way of life, of hunting and fishing on the land, ensuring that Inuit are consulted in a meaningful and direct way before development occurs, and for their lifetime of projects and ensuring that Inuit rights and interests are continued to be respected. So those are some of the examples that I'm talking about in the Nunavut region. I can talk about things like the Inuit employment and decision-making process and so on, but I don't think I really want to get into that because that's something that would be more useful to um, Inuit beneficiaries. <coughs> Would you want to talk a little bit about your role in all of, of this? Because I think it's that something. That um, talk about yourself right now. I think what I would just <coughs> like to state is that uh, my role in Nunavut was that. Um, the Inuit in the Western Arctic voted for uh, the boundary division between the Northwest Territories and Nunavut and making sure uh, that happened mm -hmm. in the early uh, 1990s. But I just want to state that while there are these significant uh, arrangements that are happening in the Nunavut region, I also want to state that uh, there are significant uh, agreements that have recognized Inuit rights within my lifetime. And they include the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Migratory Birth Convention Act of 1995, which is the only international instrument that recognizes and respects the uh, rights of Inuit in land claims in which they can use uh, the birds and bird byproducts uh, for handicrafts and other things. There are four land claims agreements in Canada. 
in Inuit, the Inuit territory. <coughs> Inuit were involved in the NAFTA environmental side agreement in which <coughs> Inuit rights were not only recognized, but <coughs> um, safeguarded. There are the land holding corporations in Alaska. There's home rule and government. There's a recognition of First Nations, Inuit and Métis in the Canadian Constitution Act 1982 within Section 35. All of these are very significant agreements that recognizes the governing structures of Inuit, Métis, and First Nations in Canada and abroad. And that is why I decided to highlight them. <coughs>